this would normally be upon a video where I make some poor taste joke about, you know, how it sucked politically and mentally, but you know what? At least we got that Avatar game this year. Did anyone even play that? 2023 has finally come to a close, and as per tradition on this channel, it's time to go over my end of the year list for all media I watched, played, and listened to. And yes, you read the title of this video correctly. It's just best media of 2023, not worst. Now, don't get me wrong, there were some bad things I did experience this year, but honestly, aside from the fact that there just weren't that many bad things I like watched, listened to, and played this year, I honestly just don't really want to talk about them this year. I don't want to talk about how The Witcher crashed and burned with season three. I wasn't going to waste my time playing Atomic Heart, even if that crispy ass critic clip was honestly funny as hell. It happened. I didn't want any of this, but none of it matters right now. So what does matter, you crispy ass critter? Oh, oh my God! I don't want to talk about Exoprimal annihilating my hopes and dreams for a proper Dino Crisis remake. And I don't want to be yet another channel talking about the MCU slowly crawling towards its death right now. Look, I spent half my year this year for the channel writing an in-depth review of one of the worst films I've ever seen, and the other half coping and seething knowing one of my favorite game franchises is definitely done for good. I need some motherfucking positivity. Anyways, that's all I got. No more wasting time. Let's get into it! So as far as films go, this is definitely the least amount I've seen in a hot second. Not really sure why, just for whatever reason, I didn't go to the movies that often this year. One of those reasons will be a little more clear towards the end of the video, but otherwise, I still wanted to at least go into what were more or less the best movies I saw this year. You know what? I'm just gonna say it. Chris Pratt is not that bad as Mario. Wait, no, 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 don't leave. Please come back, please come back, please come back! This one's pretty easy to talk about. This year was absolutely killer when it came to video game adaptations, and Mario was no exception. It does pretty much exactly what you would expect. It's pretty much just a lighthearted origin story for Mario and Luigi. There's not really a lot to talk about because in typical Illumination fashion, there isn't really much substance here. But for something like Mario, I think the simplicity works perfectly fine, and probably works in the film's favor. It doesn't really take itself too seriously, the voice acting across the board is decent, the animation is absolutely stunning, and it's overall just a blast to watch. If you're not really into Mario and don't really pick up on all the little references and easter eggs, this movie's probably not gonna be for you. But for everyone else, it's harmless fun. I do think there's potential for something much better down the line, especially when stories and Mario games in the past have been really really good before, but this is a nice way to start things. So this movie is really, really hard to judge for a number of reasons. Not because it's bad, because let's be real, it's absolutely incredible. But like when I talked about Dune in one of these lists a couple years ago, this is just part one of a two-part saga. So that kind of begs the question, do I review it as is, or do I review it as a whole when it finally finishes in like 10 years? Well, reviewing it by itself, yeah, it is pretty great, but I don't think it's as good as the first film. Animation-wise, it's better and more stunning than ever, like... I genuinely cannot believe they managed to achieve this level of animation across this entire film. But story-wise and character-wise, something felt... lacking. Miles is still a fantastic character, Gwen is just as great, seeing all of these Spider-Men across these different universes is super cool to see, but I really feel like the film gets lost in three areas. One, the obvious build-ups in the next film. This especially makes the third act of the film really, really drag. There is a lot that could have been left on the cutting room floor when it came to this. Two is the multiverse concept. Yeah, this is one of the cooler movies to do this recently, but it's still another movie that gets really lost in propping up as many cameos as possible to show this concept off. I know given the context of the story that I won't spoil, it makes sense, but it still gets a little overbearing. Three is just the general lack of polish this film seemed to have upon release. Not in the animation category, obviously, but in so many weird and bizarre ways that even directors Phil Lord and Chris Miller tried to pass off as really quirky things that they did with the movie. People kept reporting different versions of the film in terms of dialogue that was getting updated as the film was in theaters. The digital and home release have updated scenes and dialogue, or dialogue that just outright changed. The sound mixing when the film initially came out was absolutely awful. There's no really getting around that. I know it did get fixed later, but still, this gives me the sense that this movie wasn't ready for release yet. And considering how working conditions reportedly were behind the scenes and how we have absolutely no clue when the next film is coming now, I wouldn't really rule that possibility out. All that said, do I still think the movie is bad? No, it's still great. I think they just need to take this movie as a lesson in patience and really make sure the next one is more polished in certain areas.
see, guys? This is what happens when you let people who love Transformers make a Transformers movie. I don't know why it took you this long to figure out, but better late than never, I guess. Transformers Rise of the Beast is a pretty good time for the most part. It isn't without its flaws, for sure. The whole Beast Wars aspect is kind of wasted potential, as they don't really do much with the Maximals in this. I don't really like that they brought back Optimus's more, uh bloodthirsty and pessimistic take from the Bay sequels, looking at you, Age of Extinction. The villains are just kind of... there. Even with one as big as Unicron finally coming to live action. But everything else is what you'd expect at this point. It's a bunch of fun robot throwdowns with thankfully some decent human characters again. I don't think this one is as good as Bumblebee was, hell, even as good as the 2007 film, but this is definitely a top tier Transformers movie. What that says about the quality of a franchise when a movie that mostly just exists to a lot of people is one of the better films, I'll leave that up to you. I got really low standards for these movies, Jesus Christ. But if you like Transformers, you'll find something to like out of this. It's what you would expect from a Transformers film without any of the obnoxious filmmaking the base sequels had, and honestly, you know what? That's more than good enough for me. <laughs> No, I'm not kidding. I've loved Five Nights at Freddy's for a very long time. Like, ever since that one goofy guy on YouTube did a funny Let's Play of it. What was his name again? I don't fucking know. FUCKING WHAT?! I love most of the early games, but the turn the franchise has taken in the past few years is something that, let's just say, I'm not really a fan of. Games are coming out that are either not of much note or infamously broken. A story that's getting more and more convoluted than Kingdom Hearts because Scott is desperate to make sure MatPat doesn't guess anything correctly. And a fandom that seems to in some way on the regular. So watching this film after how long it was stuck in development hell was one of the best breaths of fresh air I've had in a really, really long time. There's no more of the science fiction route the games took, there's no more convoluted plot lines, timelines, and whatnot. We're back to the status quo. A story about five kids murdered by an evil man who possessed the animatronics of the pizzeria they were killed at. But what we got here is surprisingly a lot more nuanced than I think anyone anticipated. Because while we do get some stuff with the animatronics in this movie, and it's obviously great to see... What's that? Elephant green screen effect. There's also a pretty decent story about some guy doing his best with a situation that's out of his control. Josh Hutcherson gives a performance that is honestly way too good for something like Five Nights at Freddy's, giving us a story about his missing brother and his attempts to take care of his sister Abby when all the cards are stacked against him. Vanessa is also a much better character here than she was in the games, just by proxy the fact that A, she's an actual fucking character this time, and B, playing around and twisting ideas and plot points from the games in ways I didn't really expect to see. And of course, Matthew Lillard is William Afton, the purple guy. We all knew this casting was goaded, and he isn't here for long, but he makes every moment count. This movie is not going to be for everyone. Just like Mario, if you're not a fan of the games, you're not going to pick up on Easter eggs, you're not going to appreciate the little nuanced details the team here took care of when adapting the games. Like how incredible the animatronics look in this film. Seriously, these animatronics look amazing. This is a movie made by FNAF fans for FNAF fans. If you aren't into it, you won't get much out of it, but if you've been into Five Nights at Freddy's like I have, you have yourself one of the best video game adaptations out there. I am not joking or exaggerating. I didn't get to see Oppenheimer in time. You can kill me later. I don't know what I can really say about this movie that hasn't already been said at this point, considering the phenomenon it came this past year. Barbie genuinely deserves every bit of praise it has gotten this year, from its fantastic script, its themes and dialogue, its hilarious performances, its distinct style. I mean, what flaws does this movie really have? I don't know, maybe the bits with Will Ferrell and the Mattel company were... I don't know, just kind of there. But outside of that, you have a movie that by all means shouldn't have been good as it was. Like, I wasn't expecting to watch a legit existential crisis happen by the end of the film, for one thing. Greta Gerwig proves that once again she is one of the best directors of our generation. Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling give some of the best performances of the year. This movie deserves its phenomenon status in every aspect. And I think that's where I'll leave it because I'm sure most of you have seen it and know this already. But if you haven't watched it yet, do yourself a favor and please go watch it. So when it comes to what's usually my favorite movie of the year, sometimes I can be pretty confident on what my favorite of the year is going to be. This year kind of threw me a curveball, though. I ended up coming across a movie that, honestly, I haven't seen a whole lot of people talk about and that I personally feel needs a lot more recognition. That movie is No One Will Save You on Hulu. 
On the surface, No One Will Save You is an alien invasion movie. It follows a woman named Bryn as she fights for her life against these aliens trying to kidnap and take her over Invasion of the Body Snatcher style. But when you first watch the film, there's something really off you might notice at first, and it doesn't hit you until Bryn tries to say something in this movie. This film doesn't have dialogue. Across the entire hour and a half runtime, there is, no exaggeration, only three words of dialogue spoken across the entire film. The first part of it is establishing Bryn as a character in the small town of hers, her hobbies and interests, what she does for a living. Then we get to the actual alien invasion part, which is incredibly tense and white knuckled. The aliens are, for the most part, uninspired in their designs. They're pretty much exactly what you would expect from a traditional alien. But what this movie does so well is two things. One is the increasingly oppressive atmosphere. As the invasion progresses, Bryn finds herself fighting against more and more of these aliens as they get more and more aggressive and downright disturbing in some scenes. The second is when you find out what this film is truly about and what the allegory of this film is. This is a film that covers topics of grief, loneliness, regret, sadness, guilt. When you find out towards the end of the film, what it's really about, it's a pretty depressing gut punch. You can tell director Brian Dufield had a very specific story he wanted to tell, and he tells it brilliantly. A lot of this is also helped by Caitlin Deaver's performance as Bryn. She's been one of my favorite actresses for a while now, ever since I first watched Booksmart. Are we gonna go to school or? Nope. I don't think we are. No, nope, we're just gonna stay. Here. But here, she gives her best performance yet. It's already impressive how much she does in the film as a whole, but managing to do all this while only delivering three words of dialogue across an entire film? That takes some serious talent. You've heard me say this a lot for my favorite films this year, but I'll really emphasize it for this one. This movie's not gonna be for everyone. You remember when Skin and Marink came out earlier this year and people either found it to be one of the most boring films they've ever seen or one of the most horrifying? I think that same sentiment can be applied here. Obviously, this movie's a lot more accessible than something like Skin and Marink, but you have to be a very specific type of watcher to fully enjoy and appreciate a movie like this. If a movie without dialogue sounds boring to you, you're not gonna get into this movie. But if you can appreciate a movie that tries something unconventional, that wants to tell a story in a different way, that does things you wouldn't normally expect to see in a movie like this narratively, then you'll absolutely eat this movie up. No One Will Save You is the best movie I saw in 2023, and the only bad thing I can say about it is that since it was a streaming release on Hulu, it'll likely never see the light of day physically as we get closer and closer to this even worse dystopian invasion of digital content. So previous years, my list for shows was a bit of an afterthought, something to just throw in just because I had to, but this year, kind of the opposite happened. I watched a lot more TV shows this year than I have in a very long time, not even just ones that came out this year specifically. So with that in mind, let's talk some of the best I watched. Star Wars under Disney fascinates me, because in the same breath they can give us some of the absolute best content Star Wars has ever put out, and simultaneously put out some of the worst. Thankfully, The Mandalorian Season 3 falls under the much better category. After how disappointing last year was with Boba Fett and Obi-Wan, The Mandalorian is once again carrying modern Star Wars on its back. Everything about this season hits on all the right notes. The focus on further world-building Mandalore and the people that live on it, the character interactions between Din Djarin and everyone else, finding a better balance of handling Grogu, it continues to be the best thing Disney is currently putting out as far as Star Wars goes. Yeah, there are issues here and there, like that whole episode with Jack Black and Lizzo was, uh, something. But it pretty much delivers exactly what you want. It's the most concise and tightly put together season with one overarching narrative this time, and it works really well in its benefit, unlike the first two seasons being more, uh, globe trotty, Galaxy trotty? I don't know where this joke is going. Let's just move on. It's a genuine shame this show got cancelled, because Muppets Mayhem is definitely one of the better shows on Disney Plus right now, and definitely one of the best the Muppets has had to offer in a really long time. In case you haven't seen it at all, Muppets Mayhem follows only the characters of the Electric Mayhem as they set out to record their very first album, and in usual Muppet antics, it goes exactly how you'd expect. Tell you to stop being so precious and start writing music again. Says the guy who only writes parody songs, got you! 
The writing of the show is absolutely on point. It's classic Muppets at its best. The jokes in here are almost all comedy gold. I can't think of a single one that didn't land with me. The music, as expected, is fantastic across the board. Lily Singh surprised me improved. She can actually be pretty funny when she's given a good role and a good script. The different nods and cameos from across the music industry are all very well played. After years of Disney not doing anything with the movies, canceling the ABC show, and doing whatever the hell Muppets Now was, Seriously, what even the hell was that? Muppets Mayhem was a great return to form. Again, it sucks that the show got cancelled, but hopefully this just means more and better Muppets stuff is around the corner to compensate. So, I never watched Star Wars Rebels. I've heard it's good from a lot of people, but I've never really sat down and watched it myself. And as much as I did like Ahsoka fine enough, I think your enjoyment of this show is going to hinge a lot on whether or not you followed it, and Clone Wars for that matter. I never finished watching it front to back, but there was a time when Clone Wars was my absolute favorite thing to come out of Star Wars, and Ahsoka was my favorite character. And she still is one of my favorites to this day for sure, and that's also why I was so interested in watching the show. But if there's one immediate complaint I can give it, it's the fact that you need all of this background to fully appreciate it. I've already hopped off the MCU at this point, and I don't really care how good these shows are. I don't want to have to feel like I'm doing homework just to enjoy this show. That being said, from a perspective like mine, is it still good? Yeah, it's decent. I don't know much about these characters from Rebels, but I liked seeing them here fine enough. Obviously, I have the most attachment to Ahsoka here, and god, that episode that calls back to the Clone Wars, some of the best Star Wars content I've ever watched. But again, I only think that because I have so much attachment to Clone Wars as a kid. At its core, the rest of Ahsoka is fine. It has decent fights, decent effects, decent everything. The best part of the whole show, ironically enough, were the villains that have not been in anything prior to these shows. These two ex-Jedi are some of the best characters, let alone the best villains, Star Wars has seen in a really long time. There's a surprising amount of depth to them that I haven't really seen from any Star Wars villains in a while besides... I don't know, Darth Vader, but that seems to be the only thing Disney hasn't been consistently getting wrong. But outside of that, Ahsoka isn't half bad. Just be prepared because how much you enjoy it purely hinges on how much you've watched beforehand. In that sense, I guess Ahsoka is much better than I'm giving it credit for since I could follow it just fine. But I'm also not going to blame people for not being well because they didn't watch, let's see, seven seasons of Clone Wars, five seasons of Rebels, three seasons of Mandalorian, and one season of Boba Fett, just to fully appreciate every detail the show has to offer. So this was the year I finally bit the bullet on watching The Boys, and during a time where I'm just generally fed up with the MCU and DCEU, God, what a breath of fresh air this show was. The Boys is honestly one of the best superhero things happening right now. The commentary can be on the nose sometimes, like really on the nose about the genre being oversaturated and uh there is no problem it is safe to go out period some of the political commentary let's just call it that but the characters absolutely carry the show and are some of the best in the genre the same can generally be said about gen v a spinoff that came out this year focusing on a group of college-age superhero students unraveling a conspiracy happening at their school but in some ways i honestly think it might be just a tad better than the boys it's not all perfect. Again, the show can be really on the nose. A lot. Well, I'm kind of like PewDiePie without the Nazi stuff. But unlike the boys who had a majority of characters in a gray area where they were more like anti-heroes than actual heroes, Gen V has characters that up front are a lot more likable as protagonists, while still keeping the depth the characters of the boys have. I especially really like too how their powers also play a role in each character's insecurities, weaknesses, and struggles a lot more than in the boys. Like how Mary has issues involving self-harm but her superpower is controlling blood. It's handled with a lot more maturity and respect than I initially expected, and while it does have its moments of being juvenile just like the boys, the characters are handled with a lot more care given the kind of topics it covers throughout the show. It has that same char, or in some cases lack thereof, that the boys has, but a different level of emotional maturity that the boys never really seem to get the full grasp on. If this is what to expect moving forward both from this show as well as the boys, we're really going to be in for one of the best superhero shows ever made. I wouldn't say it's the absolute best though. That goes to this next century. Two years ago, I called the first season of Invincible the best show of 2021. And now, after a two-year wait, I've gone head over heels for Invincible. I started reading the comics, and it's quickly become one of my favorites. And while I don't want to judge the show too early since only the first half of season two is out, 
Invincible just keeps finding ways to get better and better and better. The animation still looks great. Mark Grayson is still one of the best superheroes in modern media. The side characters are some of the best in the genre. Most of the issues I and most other people probably had from the first season are all fixed here. All culminating in a great mid-season finale that, while not quite reaching the strength of season 1's finale, still keeps you at the edge of your seat. And how about that Adam Eve special they dropped over the summer? Absolutely, 100% best episode of the show yet. The animation is top-notch, the fight on the highway is one of the best superhero fights I've ever seen, Eve as a character is giving even more depth and nuance than she had before. The fact that this episode made me so emotional in such a short period of time is a testament to how insanely high quality the worlds, the writing, and the characters are of this show. And yes, I would still call it better than The Boys, because while The Boys is a show that perfectly satirizes the genre of superheroes, Invincible does that too to a certain degree in similar ways. But Invincible is a show that still feels proud to be a superhero show. It isn't ashamed of what it is. It's well aware it's a show in a genre that has hit peak fatigue this year, but still presses forward because it has a story to tell. It knows its world is great, it knows its writing is great, and it knows its characters are great. It has a level of confidence that no other superhero show or movie has right now, even at its worst. God, I just, I love this show so much. And somehow it wasn't my favorite of the year. It can be tough to end the show on a high note. It's really hard to end the show on a second, separate high note. But every once in a while, you get that extremely rare franchise that is somehow able to have a perfect ending to it three different times and three different shows. Side note, I should really watch Breaking Bad sometime. Adventure Time, Fiona and Cake was a show that I was initially really worried about. After having such a fantastic finale with the original show and an even better one with the Together Again episode of Distant Land, I wondered how on earth they were going to keep making new shows and stories for this series. Adventure Time is my favorite show of all time, and there's a certain level of, let's say, gatekeeping I personally have because it just means so much to me. I was so nervous because I didn't want a spinoff to come out and possibly ruin or stain that. The show is like the seventh or eighth time I've cried watching it. Fiona and Cake is a spinoff that we didn't really need, but I'm so glad it exists. It does what Adventure Time does best. Tell incredibly deep, moving, personal stories for its characters, but in the most surreal and creative ways possible. This isn't just a show about Fiona and Cake and their journey jumping across dimensions to save their own. It's a story about Simon, a man who has lost everything and can't come to terms with it, a man who has lost the love of his life and is doing everything he can to bring her back, a man who is trying to adjust to a world he very clearly doesn't belong to, a man working with what he once considered inner demons to help him cope and overcome the trauma he's dealt with for such a long time. And it's all on a show that at the same time, We'll crack jokes like this. This is my top fantasy! The story Fiona and Cake tells of Simon and how they finally officially conclude the story is somehow even more moving and emotional than it was when the show ended. And again, this is the third time they've done this now with Adventure Time. It certainly helps too that the entire show around it is just as fantastic and creative as Adventure Time usually is. It does take a little bit of getting used to hearing characters curse and do more adult things, Honestly, came off a little edgy at first. But I got used to it, and given the context of the show, it does feel appropriate. The whole idea of world jumping gives Adventure Time some of its most creative ideas yet, from a world where Ice King and by extension Simon is fully under control, to a post-apocalyptic world that gives us the hardest fucking design for Marceline I've ever fucking seen. Don't you look tasty. Like, holy shit. Even the side characters in Fiona's world are given so much more nuance and depth than they have any right to. Every inch of this show was handled with a ton of care. This team knew they weren't going to screw this up, because they knew they had something fantastic here. Fiona and Cake shouldn't have worked, it really shouldn't have, but against all odds, it's a perfect reminder to me of why I love this show to death, why it's been such a huge and influential part of my life, and why it's the best show I watched in 2023. A second season has been renewed for it, and if the team working on Adventure Time manages to keep this quality up, I cannot, for the life of me, Wait to see what comes next. Alright, now let's get into music. Listen to a lot of good music this year and... Okay, that's all I have for the intro for this one. This one's not very long. Let's just get into it. So, this one's cheating a little bit since this is technically a deluxe edition of an album that came out two years ago, but I still feel the need to bring it up here because this, right here, 
is how you do a deluxe edition of an album. Call Me If You Get Lost, the estate sale sees Tyler adding eight new tracks to the lineup of his original album, which is still one of, if not my favorite hip hop album. But these tracks are so well made that they could honestly pass off as a new album following up Call Me If You Get Lost. These tracks do a lot of the same that the original record did so well. A lot of controlled chaos in the production, smooth flow from Tyler and his vocals, a list of fantastic features from other artists, and DJ Drombo continuing to prove that he needs to be everyone's hype man. Boyfriend Girlfriend sounds so well put together for something that's considered a demo track. I love the instrumentals of Wharf Talk and Heaven to Me, the production on Dog Tooth. The standout here is definitely though, Sorry Not Sorry, a powerful ballad of Tyler acknowledging, regretting, and moving on from his actions in the past. It is his best song to date, I'm not even joking. The estate sale, again, is what deluxe albums should strive to be. Not just a couple of bonus tracks thrown onto the album, but something that feels like its own album attached to what is already the best album from Tyler the Creator to date. The Aces have been one of my favorite alternative bands in recent memory, and they keep their gold streak going with their third album here. I've Loved You For So Long feels like an even more mature take on their last record, Under My Influence. It's now about LGBTQ rights and relationships, but handled with a sincerity and integrity that the last album didn't seem to quite have. While Under My Influence felt a lot more direct, I've Loved You For So Long as an album from vocals to instrumentation to production takes a more artistic approach. Because some of these songs don't even have to directly be about the band members' experiences being LGBTQ. Songs like Not The Same are still powerful ballads about a couple slowly growing apart. Suburban Blues is still a tragic song detailing being incredibly miserable with your life. The title track is still a somber track about waiting for so long to be with someone you've loved for what felt like forever. I wouldn't call this their best record yet, I still do have a soft spot for their first album when my heart felt volcanic, but I've Loved You For So Long is the Ace's most mature album to date, and if you haven't heard of this band yet, I strongly recommend you check them out. I have weird feelings nowadays when it comes to Nate Wants to Battle. During my time in high school, he was one of my favorite musicians, putting out some of my favorite cover songs, anime theme song covers, and video game songs at the time. But as the years have gone by, especially after he released his first two original albums, Sandcastle Kingdoms and Pain and Exposure, I kind of stopped listening to him. I love the direction he was starting to take with his original music, like, a lot. Both of these albums, especially Sandcastle Kingdoms, are among the busts I've listened to. But Nate kept doing his thing with anime covers and video game songs, and while I didn't really dislike that, I definitely outgrew it from high school. I was craving something original from him again after how well his first two original albums did. I didn't really want another FNAF-themed album or Zelda-themed album. This past summer, we finally got that with To Let Go, and it feels good to be back. To Let Go, in certain ways, might be some of Nate's best work to date. Not my personal favorite, but To Let Go is very straightforward in what it's doing. Nine tracks of new metal and rock that calls back to the rock of the mid-2000s. There might be a lot of Linkin Park stuff from around the time. Crawling in Circles and Let the Floodgates Open are some of his best songs to date. I love the hard rock sound of Viral. And the title track To Let Go has a great blend of rock and a little bit of a tronic, again, kind of like Lake and Park. But it does it in a way that doesn't feel as derivative as, say, Pain and Exposure being the best Panic of the Disco album. I've been waiting five years for Nate to release an album like this, and it was certainly well worth the wait. There's so much I want to say and talk about with this album that I can't entirely do just within this video. And in all honesty, this album is good enough that I could give it its own video proper. I absolutely love Tessa Violet. I've loved her stuff since Crush went viral in 2018, and she is without a doubt one of my favorite musicians of all time. Bad Ideas is one of the best records I've ever listened to, and while I don't think My God quite reaches the same heights, it's still a fantastic pop album with Tessa's musical style getting even better. My God and Bad Bitch are absolute earworms with fantastic production. The slower ballads like Again Again and Song Without a Title are a great display of Tessa's versatility. And it all culminates in one gut punch of a final song with the punk ballad You Are Not My Friend. In so many ways, My God is a fantastic reminder of why Tessa is one of my favorite musicians ever, and I can't wait to see where things go from here. Now I will say, in spite of what I said about movies earlier, usually when it comes to most years, I sometimes struggle as to what my favorite's going to be. So like, you know, sometimes the same couple movies will kind of go back and forth as to, you know, what's going to be my favorite. Same thing kind of goes for albums. Every once in a while there is an obvious winner, but sometimes I can struggle and it's kind of debate, you know, what's going to be my favorite movie, what's going to be my favorite show, etc. But when it came to music this year, not even a 
fucking contest. This is why By Paramour was hands down, no questions asked, the best album I listened to this year. I've consistently loved their stuff since I was a teenager, with Riot being my favorite and their self-title being a very close second, but after this year, This Is Why is definitely their best yet, and not even exaggerating, one of the best rock albums I've ever listened to. This album in so many ways feels like the culmination of what Haley Williams, Zach Farrow, and Taylor York have been working on for so long. The title track is an absolutely incredible work of alternative rock. The News is a great anti-ballad against modern journalism. You First is a really direct revenge song that in some ways feels like a spiritual successor to Misery Business. Running Out of Time is one of, if not Paramore's best song to date. The amount of depth that went into the song's production, lyrics, and vocals about never having enough time to do anything. It's an amazing callback to Paramore's more angsty period, but with a level of maturity that their older records didn't have. When I say this album feels like a culmination, I really mean it. It has the emo edge of All We Know Is Falling, the in-your-face punk of Riot, the alternative feel of Brand New Eyes, the emotional maturity of their self-titled, the lyricism of After Laughter, and the artistry of Haley's solo albums, Petals for Armor and Flowers for Vases. Something I've always loved about Paramore is how versatile they've been while still managing to stay true to who they are at their core. So many musicians struggle to transition to new genres, but in their career, Paramore has gone from emo, to punk, to alternative, to pop rock, to 80s rock, to art rock. And yet, every album they've put out has been nothing less than fantastic. This is why it feels like the album they've been building up to this entire time. And I do know that might be a bit controversial, because I know there's a handful of hardcore fans that aren't really a big fan of this album. And in some ways, I do understand that. This album did also catch me off guard at first with how different it felt from their past work. But knowing what they've made beforehand, and hearing little pieces of everything across this entire record, I really feel that, with time, this is going to be considered their best by a certain legion of fans. Remember when Linkin Park first released A Thousand Suns? It was so different from what Linkin Park had done before, and it was pretty polarizing when it first came out. Now, you have certain parts of its fandom that call it their best album. I think a similar thing is going to happen to This Is Why. I mean, being their second album to get a Grammy nomination is not anything to look over. This Is Why by Paramore is an achievement. It's one of the best rock albums I've listened to, it's Paramore's best album to date, and my pick easily for the best album of 2023. So yeah, I saw a couple good movies this year, some pretty good TV shows, and listened to some really good albums, but video games? Damn. God damn. Video games went hard this year. Everything I played this year was at its worst amazing. So many things I played. Game of the year material. There was so much coming out that I just couldn't even keep up. I didn't even have time to play something like Baldur's Gate 3 because I was still too busy playing Zelda. More than any other list I've done, I know there are tons of games I've missed out on. This is definitely a year for the history books in terms of quality games. I don't think we've had a year this good since 2007. So, you know, what better way to start off the list than with a remaster of a game over 20 years old? Is this cheating? Maybe it is. I kind of feel like it's cheating. But whatever, it's my list. Metroid Prime is already one of my favorite games, so of course I immediately jumped on playing this when they surprise launched it last February. There's not a ton I can really say because, at its core, it's Metroid Prime. Just enhanced and better. The game looks amazing, definitely one of the best looking games on the Switch, and oh my god, twin stick controls, finally, in a Metroid Prime game. There is more I could say, but since this is a remaster of a game you already know is fantastic, all I'll say is that this is the best way to play Metroid Prime. And if you've never played it before, I can't express enough how much you should check it out. So this was a really pleasant surprise this year. Amnesia the Bunker was announced out of fucking nowhere last year with a release only a few months later, at least initially. And what we have here is probably one of the best horror games come out in a really long time. In terms of story, there isn't as much here as in past games. This is definitely an overcorrection of Rebirth's hyperfocus on story and characters, but it makes up for this with its gameplay. Your goal in the bunker is simple. There's a monster stuck in a World War I bunker with you, and you have to find your way out. Only item placement is randomized, and how you complete objectives is entirely up to you. And when I mean up to you, I really mean up to you. This game opens up so many options and ways for you to accomplish your goal, it really means it when it says that if you think there's another way to solve a puzzle or get into another room, there probably is. The level of care and detail that went into giving you this much agency is absolutely immaculate. 
And the monster? God, I have not seen a monster this great since Alien Isolation. Just like that game, you have a monster that is just as adaptable as you are, learning from how you play, and it makes the dynamic gameplay even more dynamic than it already is. Again, there's a lot lacking in story. You really have to go out of your way to figure out everything that's going on here, but it more than makes up for that with one of the best gameplay loops in the genre. If you're into horror games, you owe it to yourself to play this at least once. It is the best Amnesia game since Dark Descent. Okay, so I'll address the elephant in the room real quick. This game's launch was not smooth. It was pretty bad, especially on PC. It got better over time on consoles. I don't know the state it's in on PC currently, and that is a shame because underneath all of that, you do have one of the best Star Wars games ever made. On the surface, it's not really doing anything revolutionary. It's another Souls-esque Metroidvania game set in the Star Wars universe. You have most of your abilities at your disposal from the first game and a whole slew of new ones, including three new lightsaber stances. It's an overall more detailed and, uh, I say this very loosely, polished version of Jedi Fallen Order. Where Jedi Survivor really shines is with its story and characters. I really think that this saga of games is the best we have ever gotten from Star Wars. And yes, that includes pre-Disney Star Wars. I love this cast of characters to death. Cal Kestis, BD-1, Marin, Seer, Grease. I've never loved Star Wars characters so much in my life. And they're in a fantastic story about <coughs> survival touching on themes of fear and anger, loss and love, and even giving us a twist that still manages to be surprising, even knowing full well it's going to happen. I'm torn, because I've given other games in the past, like Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, shit for not being ready for release. Or hell, even this year, Starfield came out, and that was definitely disappointing. One large part of that was because of the usual Bethesda bugs and the uh, quirks their games have. But where this differs is that those games, at their core, were still games I didn't enjoy entirely and therefore couldn't put myself through their issues to keep going. Jedi Survivor, at its core, is one of, the, if not the best Star Wars game I've ever played. It just sucks that like, the game got buried underneath something that wasn't ready to come out yet. Like Jedi Survivor, Spider-Man 2 isn't doing anything revolutionary. In terms of gameplay, it's just a much better Spider-Man game than the last two. You have new combat options at your disposal, a bigger map to traverse, and two Spider-Men to play around with to complete all kinds of different activities across New York. It's a much better game than the first game in Miles Morales. But damn, it does this so well. The gameplay loop of Spider-Man 2 is great. Combat is a ton of fun, traversal is the best it's ever been in a Spider-Man game, and the story is great stuff too. Having this story focus on Peter and Miles with their insecurities, their fears, their anger, and overall showing us a darker side of the Spider-Men is a treat to watch. Ultimately, I don't know if I need to tell you all of this, we all know by this point why Spider-Man is so beloved, but like the first two games, it's how they present and deliver all of these details that make it stand out. For better or for worse, it's more of what made Insomniac's previous Spidey games so great. And in my case, it's definitely for the better. So, I have a confession to make. I don't really care for the original Resident Evil 4. I don't dislike the game, I think the game itself is fine, but some of the data mechanics of it, especially in its controls, made it very hard for me to get into. The remake, on the other hand, was something I was on board with immediately, especially given the quality of Resident Evil games the past few years. And ultimately, this was a take I could get down with and enjoy. Once again, Capcom is setting the standard for how to do a remake. Resident Evil 4 takes everything you love about the remakes of 2 and 3 and combines it perfectly with the arcade style of the original Resident Evil 4. And the best part is that it's all presented in a way that doesn't make the original game obsolete. It's just different. The story and presentation are different, taking itself a lot more seriously, and as a result, has much better characters and characterization than the original game. Are you sensing a pattern yet for what I look for in good media? And what feels like for the first time in a very, very long time, Capcom has gotten DLC for Resident Evil right. Not that it was all bad before, but Separate Ways is easily one of the best DLCs I've ever played. It's like an entire Resident Evil game within another Resident Evil game. This game did everything I hoped it would do. Introduced me to Resident Evil 4 in a way I could get down with and enjoy given my own personal taste. Again, I don't dislike the original game, and I can acknowledge the influence it had on the industry, and there's elements of it that I do like, such as its really campy B-movie nature. But in terms of what I personally enjoy and what I look for in Resident Evil games, the Resident Evil 4 remake is definitely more up my alley. Got 
God, what an absolutely pleasant surprise. Hi-Fi Rush is an absolute blast from beginning to end. This game came out of absolutely nowhere last January and took everyone by storm, and it's not hard to see why. It's a masterful blend of the rhythm and hack and slash genres, but it also isn't intrusive with it. Sure, you can play it like a regular hack and slash, but everything being synced up to one of the best and catchiest soundtracks I've heard in a long ass time constantly encourages you to play everything with the beat. It is so, so, so satisfying to play and to hear. The game's packed with style and charm, giving us an amazing art direction, a cast of really fun and wonderful characters, and a sense of creativity you don't really see that often in the game industry anymore. This feels like a game that would have released like two or three console generations ago and became a cult classic. A game that wasn't made out of greed or whatever was trending or whatever the popular genre was at the time. This was a passion project, plain and simple. One that I think paid off immensely well. If you haven't played it yet, you owe it to yourself to try it out. It is 100% a reason to own an Xbox. Come on, of course this was going to be towards the top of the list. So I have another confession to make. I don't really care for 3D Zelda, and not like in a Resident Evil 4 way, I mean that I've tried so hard to like 3D Zelda games. Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword, but something about these games never quite clicked with me. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't bring myself to enjoy the gameplay loop these games had despite really liking the top-down ones like Link to the Past and Link Between Worlds. That all changed when I played Breath of the Wild for the first time. I mean, what can really be said about this game anymore? This game's new approach to open-world game design was revolutionary, and you can still see how much it influenced the entire industry, even to this day. It was one of the first times a video game release that truly let you do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. It's why I spent so much time playing the game back in 2017 on Wii U, yes, Wii U, and why I called it my favorite Zelda game. Now, I can't decide between it and Tears of the Kingdom, because while I'll never forget that level of sheer gameplay freedom Breath of the Wild gave me, Tears of the Kingdom in some ways is just objectively the better game. It has more to do in its open world, it has a much larger focus on story, in some ways to its detriment, like, yeah, you have this massive open world, but the game also really wants you to follow the story this time, but in other ways, to its benefit. This is the first time since Link Between Worlds I felt truly invested in a Zelda story, and it isn't even really doing anything particularly new, it's just presenting the conflict between Link and Ganondorf in a new way. But the sheer scale of that presentation makes playing Tears of the Kingdom feel like I'm finally playing on that grand fantasy adventure people have described playing other Zelda games that I've never felt I experienced before. Gameplay-wise, everything is an upgrade. The world feels more lively, there's more to do across it, you have new and better tools at your disposal, and in addition, two more maps in the sky and underground to explore. I feel like I've still only scratched the surface of what's in this game. It could be very easy to call this my personal game of the year, and pretty much everyone would understand. It's just as quality as Breath of the Wild, and it's yet another revolutionary game people will be talking about for a very long time. But there's one game I haven't talked about yet. You've probably noticed by now that within videos, especially like these ones here, I tend to use the term favorite a lot. This is one of my favorite albums. This is one of the best shows I've ever watched. This is up there now with my favorite games. And I'll personally admit, you know, I've used those terms so much and so often that they've kind of lost meaning at this point. But every once in a while, very rarely, do I experience something I believe is essential. Something that, despite my own personal taste, I think is something everyone needs to experience. Something I feel is an absolute necessity to play, watch, or listen to at least once in your life. Something you see in those lists that say you need to experience this before you die. Something that, whether it applies to what I personally enjoy or not, is something I feel everyone has to play, or experience, or watch, or listen to. Something that is essential. Dead space is essential. I know what you might be thinking. Why would I put a very straightforward remake of a game that came out in 2008 as my pick for Game of the Year? let alone something essential. And above everything else I have and haven't talked about, isn't this the same year Baldur's Gate 3 came out? Didn't I just call Tears of the Kingdom revolutionary? Didn't I just sing high praises for Resident Evil 4 and Amnesia the Bunker? And yes, those are all true, but at the end of the day, those are all just my own experiences and recommending them based on that. 
Dead Space is a game I absolutely loved playing for the first time this year, and I have my own personal reasons for that. But at its core, Dead Space is a game I genuinely believe people of all kinds must play at some point. The last time I really felt that way at all about a video game was, funny enough, Breath of the Wild. A game that, even beyond what I enjoy in video games, is a game I think everyone needs to play at least once in their life. Dead Space is the same way. Upon playing this and finishing it for the first time, I immediately understood why this game was so highly regarded in 2008. Dead Space is one of the most horrifying experiences I've ever had, not just with the video game, but altogether. This game is absolutely relentless. You aren't safe and never will be safe. Just when you think it might be okay and want to slow down, a necromorph will pop up out of nowhere and ambush you. It's the first time since Alien Isolation that I truly didn't feel safe playing a video game. There are no save rooms, no safe spaces. You're stuck here, mostly alone as Isaac Clarke on a derelict spaceship with organisms that will do everything they can to kill you. And the only way to kill them is by tearing them apart limb by limb. Dead Space's atmosphere is extremely oppressive. The story is already horrifying enough, and watching the characters have to deal with this is one thing, but you'll be going across the Ishimura and you'll hear sounds. You'll hear ambient screams. You'll hear crawling in the walls. You'll hear things that you can't even comprehend being on a space station. You aren't just playing Isaac Clark. You are Isaac Clark. And just like him, you'll feel like you're slowly losing your sanity as you progress further and further with the story. It also helps that the game at its core is just a ton of fun to play too. Funny to say, I know, but it really is. Dead Space does a fantastic job with keeping its difficulty dynamic. If you have too much ammo, more monsters will show up. Less will show up if you move slower and are running on fumes. It knows how to make that tension stay, regardless of how strong or how weak you are. It has a similar gameplay loop to something like Resident Evil, where you're always looking for ways to earn more items, whether it be for credits, weapon upgrades, or suit upgrades. And on that note too, the weapons in this game are some of the coolest and most creative I've ever used in a video game. The core gameplay loop has that same arcade style something like Resident Evil has, while also having the dynamic, ever-changing gameplay that something like Amnesia the Bunker has. The game looks incredible, the lighting sets the mood perfectly, it only sets the stage for how horrifying things can and will get visually. The only thing I can't really comment on is how this compares to the first game, but given what I know and have seen of the original, I don't know how anyone can go back to that one, knowing this version is just even better in so many ways. The game plays better, Isaac actually speaks, the atmosphere is somehow even more feral than the original game. When I finished it, I knew I had experienced something special. If it wasn't for Resident Evil 4 being right around the corner from when I got and played this, I would have just kept playing it over and over right there and then. To this day, I still want to find time to go back and play it again, just to see what else I can do and what else I missed out on. Dead Space is a landmark game for a reason, and this remake only improves on what made it a landmark game in the first place. It's one of the best horror experiences I've ever had, it's the best game I played in 2023, it's one of the best games I've ever played. I've played a handful of games that I personally would call flawless, but if we're talking objectively speaking, Dead Space is one of the only games I can say with confidence is flawless even without my own biases being taken into account. Some of my favorite games of all time have still got some small issues or flaws that I can look past just because of how much I personally enjoy them. But when it comes to Dead Space, my personal feelings on it don't really matter in that regard. Dead Space, by all means, is a perfect game. And that's why I think it's essential. And with that, that pretty much brings the past year to a close. If you lived this far, thanks for watching. And let me know in the comments below too, you know, what were some of your favorite movies, TV shows, albums, games, whatever in the comments down below. It could be your favorite Markiplier video for all I care, I don't know. What's your favorite one? Mine was Lethal Company Part 7. Ugh. And if you like what you watch, be sure to subscribe. I've got more review editorial style videos coming like this, talking about, you know, movies, shows, games, music, the like. I can't wait to share them all with you. Hopefully this year will be a little more consistent with some personal things going on behind the scenes. I will hopefully have more time to make more videos this year. I don't know how well that's going to age. I still have to work on my last of us review. That'll be out at some point too, I promise. With that said, if you subscribe right now, I will... What will I do? I haven't even thought about a joke for this part of the video. Honestly, I didn't even think I would get this far. Are these jokes even funny? How do, how do I even be funny? Let's see. 
Oh my god, it all makes sense now. <laughs>